who is a theoretical philosopher at the Università Ca' Foscari di Venezia. Leonardo is a localization project manager, and the title of his talk is Off Human and Post Human Video Games and the Future of the Human. Leonardo. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, in order to save time, first thing first, uh, in this presentation I will just hint at some of the core arguments that you find uh, in the full paper present in the home page of the conference. Now, uh, before starting, I need to point out uh, the theoretical framework on which this paper is, uh, has been written. I believe that video games are not only a cultural manifestation of the false revolution, but an integral part of what can be called the digital cultural heritage. The act of gaming is a deep philosophical experience when done with the consciousness of the fundamental virtues of video games interrelation. Video games can be seen as mediators because they build a relation between player and game work and can offer themselves as a bridge between players and the issues they are about, thus helping them in building knowledge thanks to this relation. Social issues, technological problems, and the myths of our times are constantly present in bytes and frames of a well-made video game with these issues in mind. Due to their diffusion, they are intrinsically tied to technological evolution and in some way to such a cultural advancement. Just seeing, for example, to VR technologies or the problems between video games and drone warfare. Now, this paper is part of a broader research that follows both the perspective of philosophy of information and the phenomenological and existential approach to question on posthumanism and transhumanism, following the question what does it mean to be human? Now, I believe there are two paths towards an understanding of the relation between video games and knowledge of the human. The first one is relational knowledge, or video games as subject of philosophical analysis, or to talk, with, uh, to look at video games. What the video games, thanks to their nature of computer program, can provide in terms of knowledge of the information of contemporary technologies and our relation with evolving AIs. Here, video games are seen as a system of events, more than a set of rules, coding and programming in a video game, but taking into account the interaction and subjective experience of the act of playing a video game as lived by the player. The second way is narration of knowledge, or video games as source of philosophical issues, or to listen at video games, akin to Albert Camus novels or Gabriel Marcel's theatrical plays. What video game can provide in terms of knowledge of the different past present and future problems of the human by tackling these issues inside a unique perspective. To be considered so, a video game needs to have a sound of real direction, even more when the games clearly state so, like for example Bioshock, whose creator Ken Levine clearly stated it was a critique of Ayn Rand's philosophy. Another point to present is the, video, the idea of video games as MIOs, or Multimedia Interactive Opera. First proposed by Marco Cordi Ricciazzi in 2002 on the pages of Italian gaming journalism Game Republic, in order to underline all the elements that concur to create a video game graphic, narrative, soundtrack, programming. The harmony of the elements that composes an MIO is expressed by the word opera. In Italian language, opera means wordplay, word piece, artifact, but it is also an art form made by singers performing a dramatic work of mixed narrative and sound score in a theatrical setting. Core dimension is that of interactivity between players and games and the players themselves. This allowed to add a theoretical and ontological dimension. Video games as MIO can create an existential dimension in being symbols, that is pure relation between meaning, vehicle and subject experiencing them. Their value is in the relation that they embody, not by being something static, but rather a dynamic event. Under the light of philosophy of information, they can be seen as proper form of artistic production in the digital world, 
where immateriality, synchronicity, allocality, and relationality are key ontological dimensions. While playing, players bring with them the sum of all their experience, critical thinking, learned statement, cultural expressions, and enter in contact with issues taken by the video game in a more or less evident manner. If this contact is made with awareness, critical inquiry can arise and influence a pre-existing set, uh, pre set of knowledge. The interactivity allows the immersion of a player in a game. A player feels part of the game world, taking its avatar senses and abilities on itself, transforming it into an extension of its intentional states in the world, in the game world. Such a relation can become a peculiar form of presence, where the player is situated in a game environment and can act inside it. The first way, as I was saying, is video games as subject of philosophical analysis of the human in relation with the AIs. Now, contemporary blockbuster AAA video games strive to offer realistic challenges and life-like situations to the players that are immersed in. These require more and more computing power to be realized, even if we are far from able to create a perfect AI as in a full self-aware program as Luciano Flori clearly stated in one of his best articles, in my opinion. We, in, we might never be able to create a really self-aware AI. The real problem is that we share the infosphere with entities that are way more capable than us in completing certain tasks, that are more, uh, way more smarter than us. The real problem is, as the final question uh, says, what does all this mean for our self-understanding? Now, the study of AI is crucial for the development of AAA video games, as they need to offer a lifelike experience to players and challenges to overcome. Rather than creating a successful AI, as academia uh, seems to be, to be trying to do, game designers strive to create NPCs and surroundings bustling with life, but functional to the narrative, something that players have fun with while they enter in relation. Currently, with the current level of sophistication, player encounters AIs as NPCs or surrounding ele uh, elements in the game. The first encounter is through novelty. The player does not know how an AI will react to its stimuli outside its first existing set of knowledge. Here, it builds a relation with AI. Knowledge is gained through the relation strengthening. The player, through multiple gameplays or speaking with other players, gain knowledge of the inner world in the AI. In the end, it is able to predict its working, much like we can predict how a car will perform in certain circumstances given an ideal con condition. But there are studies that show how it can be the other way around. AI learning in the game from the observation of player action. Strategic video games are being challenged with an evolution of AIs in order to offer more challenging experiences to the player. An interesting study has been made of how StarCraft II AI can benefit from a kind of machine learning that put the AI in condition to learn from the player's action. It seems that we can speak of an epistemology of AIs, or how an AI can be, can be able to look at its surroundings, learn from it, gain knowledge of its ambient, with a higher level of acumen than the human. Smarter, more capable of completing certain tasks, but in with no way with a proper consciousness. It appears that the infosphere is starting to grow a kind of info informational organism for which information is no longer data to process or resources to gather, but a living and breathing dimension. And thus the constant enrichment of information is not a simple ethic imperative, but an existential one whatever that might mean for it and for us in the future. For now, we can see that players enter in an interactive relation with AIs more often than other categories of people, AIs that are constantly tweaked in these directions. They confront AIs in those grounds that see them as smarter, while not equally conscious and without the goal to beat the player, but to offer challenges. Moreover, the sense of immersion that allows a gamer to feel part of the game world can help in imagining how relationship with AI might develop in the future in a deeper existential way. Will we treat AIs as NPCs 
in a constant and pervasive augmented reality game, or we will have a relation with them more akin to what we established with our pets and other animals, shaking the old anthropocentrism in favor of a new way of perceiving our role in reality. And should technology be able to perfectly replicate the seasoned people, as that episode of Black Mirror for who remembers it, what would it mean to interact with Siddhartha or Caesar or Montezuma in a game of Civilization 20? We cannot understand today's mentality in relation to these issues. We are unable to state how a mentality used to these entities will react. But in well-conceived video games, these questions must find some glimpses in our future. Now, the second way uh, to which tackle the relation between video games and knowledge of the human is video games as social philosophical analysis. Narrational knowledge, as the, game, as the name implies, sees knowledge built thanks to the narration. The focus here is in no way to conceive, it is in two way to conceive narration in a video game. The first one is direct narration. The setting is given, the player interacts with NPCs, and the setting through dialogues, intermission scenes, audio, in a traditional movie-like way to narrate. The world is clearly stated, and the story unfolds in a non-linear way, with a definite beginning, multiple paths, and multiple endings. There is an authorial direction to the narration, while the player is invited to think about consequences of his action. Players are guided toward an immersion in the game's narrative, thanks to the captivating story and the refined character they meet. The second one is environmental storytelling, who has been perfectly uh, summarized in the relation before. I will only uh, make a small uh, description of the origin of the word lore, that can trace its origins from the old English lar to learn, to the old German lasjana, to follow a track, and up to the Anglo-European root lace, track furrow. It is also connected to Latin delirium, madness. To follow the story means to search for the footprints in every corner. It means for the player to have an attention to details and to be in a very particular mindset in order to build knowledge. The example of direct narration is the Deus Ex series. The first installment of narration is built on conspiracy theories a secret society of Illuminati that wants to take over the world. The player, as they see Denton, one of the augmented beings, tries to stop this. It is a world spinning into chaos, where terrorism is on the rise and the government seems to be incapable of controlling it without an excessive use of violence. A world full of inequalities. In a global pandemic, only the rich have access to the vaccine. The narration follows an herbal's journey, both for the players and J.C. Denton, and allow the player to build the knowledge of how our world can become if these issues are left unchecked. In the end, that brings the player in contact with Helios, an AI that is searching for a human to merge with in order to gain full knowledge and the final decision of the game. In the second installment, narration follows on the conspiracy theories already presented, but with a twist. The players meet different factions that embody different approaches to the future of the human that we as academics know well. A society that wants to better all humankind through biomodification towards a transhumanist life form. Another that wants the world to be destroyed and let a new posthuman race emerge from the ashes of the singularity, and so on. The final choice here is between help everyone transcend to a transhumanist life form through biomodification or let the world to be destroyed and see a new posthuman race emerge. The two prequels does not follow on these themes, but shows how the situation we already know from the previous games came to be. The protagonist is Adam Jensen, an enhanced human in a world where being a natural, that is, without qualification, is commonplace. More computing power allows the game to present a more lifelike world to the player, and enhanced prostitutes forced to, to augment themselves in order to satisfy, to satisfy their clients' kings. Racist cops that hate the guts out of enhanced Beggars searching for neurocosine, that is the drug that allows uh, them to keep the mobile medication to be rejected. The player uh, experiences discrimination firsthand, but has the power to react or to do its job. We even assist to a dialogue between two NPCs where, in a true Wittgensteinian take on language, they argue on the fact that all racism and prejudice can be tied to the original decision to give the names. Enhancement and augmentation to mechanical and biological modification.
thus giving the general public a mentality already oriented towards an opinion. The final choice is no longer on the future of the human, but to its present, to uncover the Caesar society's plan or opening the world size, or to spread the message of tolerance instead of hate, or to let the world sort itself out without taking a decision. This latest two installment of the series build up question that, while already answered in the precedent chapters, are deeply enthralling and pertaining to philosophy's course interest. What does it mean to be human? Adam Jensen can use his enhancement to silence police brutality and react violently to natural outbursts of discrimination. The games do not punish the player, but only shows its actual consequence through the serious symbols and paramount paradigm. Icarus, the man to choose to enhance himself and risk everything to reach the sun. The second element of uh, the second way of uh, narration of storytelling is environmental storytelling, or Sid Meier's civilization beyond Earth. Here, there is no narration. The story happened before each game. It predates game events. Human almost destroyed our planet with pollution, war, and by exhausting its resources. States and private companies built common spaceships, each one according to their tradition, thus presenting the player a choice of sponsor and pathways to the through the future of the human. Immersion is not in a narration, but in a world. Quotes and description that let the player take time to read them and think about them with knowledge of different pathways human can take after today. Turn-based strategic gameplay allows the player to do so by giving it time to partake in an exercise of philosophical practice. It is a slow process that requires the player to be patient and listen to the quotes Open the, open the eye in game encyclopedia, read the stories of building and units, suspend the game, and discuss them with other players in forums and social networks. If experienced with an open mindset that welcomes stimuli for our reflection and consideration, like for example the second one, which is my favorite quote of the whole game, playing the game presents a good number of elements towards the future of the human. What will be the relation with our environment when we finally accept that anthropocentrism has to be abandoned, abandoned and rejected? Is integration with technology a road to embark upon, or we will have to keep ourselves in interrelation with it? We will be able to accept these changes before it is too late for Earth. In conclusion, I want to answer to a question that was made by me while I was preparing this, uh, this presentation. Why only AAA got busted video games? Why not indie games? The answer is simple. Indie developers seem to be largely already aware of the issues detailed in this paper. Just think to make boss RCC's 2015 Read Only Memories, where one of the characters is a robot that gained true consciousness thanks to an algorithm that tied his awareness to his hardware, thus giving him a true form of situated and embodied consciousness. It is a deeply and strong philosophical statement that they chose in the whole game with positive consequences for the much discussed gender issues. We live in a world where American actors can move hundreds of thousands of parents on anti scientific behavior, like to follow the managing dietary regimes or believe that climate change is an hoax. Philosophy needs a mediator to create a relation between academia and the general public on those issues that impact what we are and what we will be, how to exercise critical thinking and be informed in the most correct way possible. Video games can be that mediator, as artistic and cultural production of the fourth revolution that impacts the everydayness of countless members of the youngest generation. Bioshock, Deus Ex Series, Beyond the Earth and the Life show that even AAA video games can tackle important contemporary issues inside market logic. That's um, a very, very, very stimulating set of ideas you presented, um, ranging from the issue of competence without consciousness to areas that have to do with the ever-renewable imminence of the post-human. 
Um, we can open this to questions. Sorry, you just got to it right at the end. I was wondering if you could clarify your views on read-only memories. Mm -hmm. um, you just you were so short on it, I couldn't really understand what your take on it was. Um, I'd be interested in hearing you talk about it a little bit more and like how you feel it relates to transhumanism and philosophy. Just a little bit more on it, because you were so fast on what you were thinking about. It. Okay. Well, the, the short answer is that I believe it is a masterpiece of contemporary indie production. The longest answer, the longest answer is that uh, for the first time, uh, we were presented when playing it with the choice of deciding what pronouns, pronouns to be given to us. This means that all the gender issues can be easily uh, dismissed, if that is a bad word, but uh, I think it can be fitting, by the idea that the language on how we relate to each other is the key of uh, considering our nature. It does not uh, express the essence of our beings, but it expresses how we relate to each other. It expresses how we can uh, live with diversity. Read only memory is a, is a game that is about diversity, about diversity and about, uh, uh, as I was saying, situated consciousness. Because if the real, uh, I agree with Luciano Flori when he says that we can create a, a full self-aware AI. But if there is a way, it is to tie the programming to the hardware. The only way to which a consciousness and identity can be grown is in an embodied consciousness. Um, the dualism it has been uh, um, is old. The dualism is old. We can't really uh, believe what uh, Cartesius said while presenting his ideas. And maybe. We won't be able to really create a, a true conscious AI, but a program that can feel its body, its robotic body, and create a, a set of machine learning based on the inputs that its body gives it, maybe it is a, a correct way to proceed through that. And this idea, I got it not through uh, reading uh, Margaret Tyess or uh, other um, other writers of posthumanism and transhumanism, but by playing a video. So, yeah, the short answer is a masterpiece. Other questions? I have a question myself, actually. Um, posthumanism as a paradigm has, perhaps surprisingly, not typically um, referred to games. In any, um, in any extended way. Um, theorists of the post-human still appear to take their references from, um, from literature, from, from areas that um, bring up uh, examples that put us in mind of transhumanism, but games have been relatively absent. Is this your reading of it? Would I be correct in saying that? But uh, as I think my presentation and my paper shows, it is very frustrating mm -hmm. because there are a lot of issues that are already inside the video games and in, um, in the future video games, in famous video games like um, Deus Ex series. Deus Ex is a take on the problems of not of posthumanism, transhumanism, neo-humanism per se, but on the problems that are inside this debate. As I said before, uh, Adam Jensen can react to what the racist cop can tell to him. He can respond with violence, or it can respond with diplomacy. The final game, the, the, the last one, uh, Mankind Divided, even allowed the player to uh, react to all the racism towards an answer being with peace. I finished the game without killing a single guard, without shooting a single bullet. And this is something that in uh, uh, contemporary AAA game is very rare. It is commonplace in, uh, in indie games, in just game cut. Uh, mm. 
the one with the spaghetti eating uh, skeleton. Undertale? Huh? No, no, it's an indie game from him. Undertale. Hmm? Undertale. Undertale. Uh, Undertale. Undertale. Just think that Undertale. Undertale, uh, if played with a pacifist take on the game, uh, shows a completely different ending and a completely different take on the whole story and the whole background. Uh, why this is present in, uh, um, in indie games and not in AAA games? We live in, a, in an area where the countless um, Call of Duties and uh, Battlefields have informed the players that the first and most entertaining way to play a video game of conflicts is through war and through violence. Why can't we have a video game that uh, allows the player to experience conflict in a pacifist way? And the, the answer came from a AAA game, Those Ex Mechan Divided, where you can play the game without shooting a single bullet and beat it. Something that I think not even the first Deus Ex allowed. So um, all these problems, all the uh, fact that a lot of the issues between posthumanism, transhumanism, and near humanism are lived uh, in a, a strict uh, conflict way, where you are the good guy who shoots the bad evil robots. There is, there are video games where this conflict it can be resolved through. Um, through dialogue and through philosophical analysis. I, th I think it is really frustrating. Why Margaret Tice, who wrote a wonderful game, My, uh, My Mother Was a Computer, didn't took into account uh, uh, video games as such, but only as examples? This is one of the, my, my frustrations. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, hi, again. I just, I think I understood your point about when you say like about talk about video games, mediation, possibility or potential to this kind of critique. But I just want to hear from you understand in what ways you would say that it's different from, for instance, like X Men, like the comic books, they already just do this kind of critique and other literary or, or but basically non video game critique. So I don't understand what's your view of the specificity, the specificity of video games and this kind of critique, for instance. Okay. Um, to limit the potential of uh, an artistic work piece to be mediated to only video games would be wrong. I totally agree with that. This is a venue where we're discussing philosophy of computer games. So I brought the issues out of computer games. And I have to take away my mask here and show the theologian uh, behind. Uh, one of my students of mine, and this is the reason for which I haven't quoted on, uh, uh, on my paper, uh, in two days she will discuss uh, her dissertation um, when she will try to uh, propose an idea of theology of art as in following the uh, Russian um, the Russian spiritists and mystics, uh, where art pieces are mediators toward the absolute. Now, I don't want to bring God inside this conversation, it would be wrong. But artworks can be uh, not only the um, elements of, uh, of cultural production, but they can, they can also allow the players or the spectators or the readers to access to, the, to a world that they do not experience yet. This is the value of mediation of the artistic products, to let the human be in contact with something that is way bigger than him, to experience this something, be it absolute, be it another culture, be it uh, um, speculation on the nature of being, or the um, vast rigorousness of a mathematical expression. This is art. Video games, if considered as art, and I know this is a, a, not, not a can I say? Not a shared idea. I know that video games as art is not a shared idea. But if video games can be considered as, as art, this process of mediation can occur. I don't know if I answered. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say there's a different ways of answering this question. I, I, 
Um, please join me in thanking Leonardo. Thanks.